just takes a moment. Um, see everybody filling the virtual lecture hall. Um, let everyone find their seats. Um, watch out for that just crocodile. Takes a moment. Um, okay. All right. Um, good. Um, should be fine. Um, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, this is our uh, our 16th lecture of the spring. Um, and I am very, very honored to be joined tonight by Gloria Groom, presenting her lecture, Cezanne, Becoming and Being. Um, I would like to thank all of you for joining us, um, taking the time out on this Wednesday. It's a little chilly in New York City, um, but um, it's nice. And I would like to thank Gloria for taking the time to join us from Chicago. Um, it really is a special honor to have her here um, with all of us. Um, I would also like to uh, quickly recognize that the New York Studio School Evening Lecture Series is generously supported in part by public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council, the Robert Lehman Foundation, and many individual contributors. Uh, please do consider making a donation either during or after tonight's talk um, by clicking on the support button on our homepage at www. Uh, myss.org and then just click on the donate button. Um, I, will, I will introduce our speaker in just one moment, but I also always like to point out that the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen is there and feel, please feel free to enter a question at any time during tonight's talk and we'll leave some time afterwards to address those questions. Um, and with that, Um, an internationally acclaimed scholar and author on 19th century French painting, Gloria Groom is currently chair of painting and sculpture of Europe and the David and Mary Winton Green Curator at the Art Institute of Chicago. A native of Tulsa, Oklahoma, um, with a PhD from the University of Texas at Austin and a degree in museology from the Ecole de Louvre and UNESCO in Paris, Dr. Groom joined the Art Institute in 1985. Since then, she has been involved in major monographic exhibitions and catalogs, including Gauguin, Odilon, Ridon, Calabois, Renoir, Manet, Seurat, Toulouse-Lautrec, and thematic exhibitions such as Beyond the Easel, decorative paintings of Bonnard, Bouillard, Denise, and Roussel, the art dealer Ambrose Boyard, uh, Impressionism, Fashion and moder Modernity, Van Gogh's Bedrooms, Gauguin, Artist as Alchemist, and Manet in Modern Beauty um, in 2019, which, devoted, which was devoted to the little known paintings, pastels, and watercolors of the artist's last years. Dr. Groom has also led the project for monographic online scholarly catalogs on the Impressionist collection, um, today uh, featuring Monet, Renoir, Pizarro, Calabot, Gauguin, and with Manet and Cezanne forthcoming. Um, and that project involves an international team of scholars, conservators, and scientists. In September 2020, uh, Dr. Groom opened Monet in Chicago, a celebration of the artist's impact on the city, including 33 paintings from private collectors in Chicago and the surrounding area. Her work on French culture has been recognized by the French Republic, from whom she received the Medal of Chevalier in the, the Order of Arts and Letters in Officier, in 2016, she was further honored with the Medal of Chevalier in the Legion of Honor. Um, her current exhibition projects include an exhibition on Cezanne in collaboration with Tate Modern opening next year in May 2022, um, as well as an exhibition on Edward Wiard in the Theater of Modern Life, which is scheduled for 2024. Um, so with that, please join me in virtually welcoming Gloria Groom. Thank you. Okay, share my screen, get this started, okay. Are we good? Yep, okay, wonderful. Um, okay, I think that's it. Well, thank you and good evening to everyone. And thank you, Sam Levy, and thank you, Graham Nichols. And I'm thrilled to be invited to be in this virtual 
uh, lecture, although I can say I'd much rather be in front of you all and in a lecture hall. And, but um, I'd also like to give a special shout out to Katie Kremnitzer, who, as I understand, was a former student at the studio school and who has been a very treasured thought partner working as a research associate at the Art Institute and uh, was a tremendous help in putting together the, this, the lecture, that's the presentation I'm giving you tonight. Um, I have not been a Cezanne scholar. I have worked as you, as Sam pointed out on almost all of the impressionists except by Cezanne. And I think the reason for that, and uh, I'm trying to get my, uh, whoops. All right, let me get this going. There we go. Is because the Art Institute has not done a Cezanne exhibition in over 70, it will be 70 years when we do our exhibition in 2022 with Tate Modern. Um, and so this was an exhibition we did with the Met back in 1952, and that's the last time we focused on him. So um, got some catching up to do, but we haven't necessarily neglected Cezanne. In fact, in 1913, Cezanne was a big part of the Armory show that was held here as well as in New York. Um, I'm showing you the two different views of the wall of Cezanne's that we had at that time. And although we didn't buy a Cezanne as the Met did in 1913, it wasn't long afterwards that we acquired through a gift of Frederick Clay Bartlett, the same collector who gave us Seurat's Sunday Afternoon on La Grande Jade and Picasso's Old Guitars, uh, gifted us this amazing basket of apples from the 1890s. And um, we just cleaned this. And it's pretty extraordinary um, what happens when you take off the synthetic varnish. And there's the conservator who um, so lovingly uh, took away that and let it just sing out with the colors that were originally intended by the artist. This is Alison Langley. And since 1996, that was really the last groundbreaking exhibition that showed Cezanne the watercolors, the drawings, the paintings uh, of his whole career. And since that time, and that was held in Philadelphia and at the Grand Palais in Paris, it was a wonderful exhibition catalog, Joe Rischel and others. But since that time, there have been plenty of Cezanne exhibitions, but they've tended to isolate parts of his career, his portraits, his early, his late, Provence, Paris, uh, Apples, um, Madame Cezanne. And that's, it's wonderful and we have certainly built on what that scholarship has given us, but we thought it was time to sort of reunite Cezanne with the 360 to really put him back together and show, give a full career exhibition, which is what we'll be doing next spring. And one of the things that was so helpful for us besides the previous scholarship, and there's so many scholars, I couldn't believe that artists write on Cezanne, philosophers, uh, art historians, curators, there's, there's, the bibliography is immense and daunting. But one of the most important tools for us was the catalog resume that came out recently online by three people who have been very involved with Cezanne, Walter Feichenfeld, a collector and Cezanne scholar, Jane Warman, who as you'll remember was one of the authors with Rewald for the, uh, the catalog resume that was in print and um, David Nash. And so we have really depended on this and it's given us so much information. And I'm just gonna give you a sense of, you can call it up by catalog number, but you can also call it up by collection. So for example, if we go to look at the Art Institute of Chicago collection, you'll see all of our nine paintings um, and our works on paper, many, drawings, watercolor, including pages from a sketchbook. We have a sketchbook. And this has been incredibly important because it means that we can call up not just collections of institutions, but we're, and you can also do these zooming in. This is before it was cleaned. It's not a very good photograph. You can call it up by genre. You can call it up by um, exhibition history. You can search under media, you can search under subject matter, you can search under decades. Um, so it has just been the most incredible tool, but 
Also very important was the fact that we could see what collections his paintings have been in. And we always consider Cezanne the artist's artist, the painter's painter. But what we found with using this, this tool, was that it really is true that the Impressionist artists did support Cezanne and bought his works, certainly by 1895 when Vollard has his very important exhibition. But the quantity that they owned is really exciting and we were able to ask for some of those to be in the exhibition and that led us to things like what well, we knew about our Gauguin. So Gauguin was one of his first collectors in the 80s. And this is a painting, the portrait of a woman in front of a still life by Cezanne, the still lifes at MoMA. And, you know, you can see that Gauguin, who idolized Cezanne, even though he writes rather cryptic things about him, was um, trying to channel some of that passivity and that distancing of his portraits of Madame Cezanne, for example. And also in the, in the um, still life, that constructivist brushwork, um, even though not so successfully, it definitely doesn't have the air of a Cezanne, those wonderful areas that are just left bare. But um, you can see how much he is learning from having this in his home. And we also wanted to draw from our expertise that we put forth in these catalogs that Sam mentioned of the Impressionist artists that are online now with the conservators, with the scientists in the lab. And here you're looking at the vase of tulips that's being examined with XRF, which will scan it and do a kind of a pigment analysis. And we're looking at thread counts and we're looking at um, the underdrawings and we're comparing them with the paintings with the works on paper to see what kind of relationship there might be. And very excitingly, we actually have on uh, and are studying these watercolor tins that came in from the Musée Granet and they will be part of the exhibition, but we're now doing a pigment analysis of those to see if there's any correlation between the oils and the and the water-based painting. So it's, it's, it's all kind of happening at the same time and we're trying to really bring Cezanne not only back to history, back to his association with the Impressionists, but up to our day to show why Cezanne. And in that sense, we've invited 10 contemporary artists who will be writing on one particular work in the exhibition. And so we feel like we've gone full circle, bringing him up to his importance and relevance today. And here you have the total of what we hope to have in our exhibition. Of course, the checklist is always on an ongoing negotiation, especially during COVID. Um, but the title of the exhibition is simply Cezanne because we went through many, many permutations and we finally realized that we were trying to do so much so that one pithy phrase or quote just wasn't going to do it. So we're back to Cezanne, but unlike the 1996 exhibition, which was also called Cezanne, we have Cezanne sans accent, without the accent. And this is in deference to the family and the Societe Cezanne, who have asked us to respect the fact that he never signed his works with the accent. The family doesn't use the accent, but that was more of a Parisian addition when they were trying to understand how to pronounce his name. And so they added the accent to it. Um, Cezanne's early works are usually considered in kind of isolation and um, kind of puzzling anomalies. And in Ted Reff's words, he calls it the works that he did before becoming, and I quote, the sober impressionist he was fundamentally to remain, very eloquently put. But what I'd like to do tonight, and I hope you'll indulge me because this is a work in process in my mind, is to rehabilitate, especially those early figurative paintings, their significance in establishing um, a certain through line for his elements that he uses, his spatial considerations that would be put into service later in the more recognizable Cezannean themes of the 1880s and 1890s. I also hope that in the next um, 35, 40 minutes or so, I'll be able to show a little bit about um, Cezanne's deliberation, his wisdom, and and even a little bit of his strategy in so far as he determines what will be seen publicly. 
I should mention that I've tried to put as many of the works that are going to be in the exhibition or rather have been asked for the exhibition in this lecture in case you want to come to Chicago next year and maybe it'll resonate more with you. Um, like this portrait of his father reading the newspaper Le Mans from 1886. And I think this is a great way to start because it shows him and on the right hand side, you see this small still life from the Musée Cranet. The still life appears in this portrait. So he's painted his father and he's also painted a painting that he did. And that really speaks to something that's very important for Cezanne, the idea that he's, um, he's copying. He's copying others, certainly in the beginning of his career, but he also copies himself. He's imitating himself. He's inserting himself into portraits. And it's also um, important that it shows us his love of the humble domestic interior and the objects therein, the, the chair that appears in other works, the still life objects that we see again and again in his, in his career, they start very early. Um, and this was of course, Cezanne trying to come to grips in the decade of the 60s, which was a very volatile time in art. You had Manet and you had Courbet. These are artists that were at the that were making breaking all of the rules. And Cezanne, of course, was trying to um, compete with them as he moves to Paris from Aix-en-Provence, as he becomes engaged with this avant-garde group of artists, but also artists who aren't like him, who don't have the same background, the same fundamental behaviors. Um, and I think you see that in these two still lives where he's on the left, it's the still life with um, bread and eggs that he submits and it's rejected from the salon. Um, this jury fed competition that happens every year where you're allowed to put two paintings in. But he's really channeling Manet here, that creamy application of paint, the dark kind of Espanolisma, that sort of Spanish dark background. And on the right, you almost think of him as looking more towards Courbet with his heavy application of paint, perhaps with a palette knife and the raw or subject matter, not so, not so refined, not so um, beau metier, the beautiful substance of the paint itself. And here you see that he doesn't have the white tablecloth. It's simply this slab of a, a lamb's leg slapped down on this slate table. And on the left, in the um, other still life, you see that he has the dishcloth, which is mitigating the dark chiaroscuro that he's using. And the dishcloth has that ubiquitous red stripe. And remember that because you're, it's, it's sort of one of those, the river runs through it. It's what runs through his work. Whereas on the right, you have nothing to mitigate between the sort of raw, um, bloody um, animal part. And one of the, um, at the Academy Suisse, this is where he went for drawing lessons, where he met Pissarro, Armand Guillaume, and where he was, he was, he had the live models. And I think this is a sketch that we have in our collection. And you can see um, already how he's, he's not a copier. He is a copier in the sense that he copies, but they're never exactly because he always does something to it, puts in a different context, edits it, changes things so that it never looks exactly, in this case, the live model, what he was looking at. And um, here you can see also something that comes up again and again in his work is in these sketchbook drawings, which he referred to it in his work throughout his career, he oftentimes would return to them. And that may be what he's done here. You can see in the right hand, there's kind of these mountains, suggestion of a mountain. And I've tried to read the script above it. I'm not able to, but you know, perhaps he came back in, and did those later. But what you're noticing is the starkness of this. And this was a drawing that ends up being used in this um, quite small painting called the autopsy. It's also known as the funerary toilet done maybe one or two years after the drawing. And here you, you're, you're really focused on the way this very theatrical light is hitting not only the, the, the corpse, but also the coroner whose biceps are kind of bulging out. And you see this blonde, bald pate 
And Cezanne started going bald in terms of his forehead receding um, in his 20s. So it's probably not Cezanne, but you start to see Cezanne kind of in these selfies in these paintings, especially the ones that are more based on imagination and his sketchbooks rather than on any kind of observation. And I think these early works are so intriguing because they're passionate and they've been considered violent. Um, but also, I think they really make a nod and let us know how important the relationship was with his childhood friend, Emile Zola, who became, a, he was a journalist, but when he becomes a great novelist, specializing in these portrayals of these raw emotions run amok um, that were in, in books that by the late 60s were very, very popular, kind of the comedy Oman of Balzac now being redone. And they both shared not only a love of art and literature, but they shared a love of what we call the fait divers, that is those kind of banal quotidian occurrences that are written about in the paper or in magazines. And they also talked about, you know, infidelity, sometimes criminal behavior. And this was what Zola was drawing from for his realist novels and naturalist novels. And he would send the manuscripts to Cezanne, they'd talk about them. And during the 70s, they, when they were 60s and 70s, when they were closest, the two of them shared this love of, of storytelling as well as the classical literature that they had studied when they were together in the school in X. Um, and one of the saddest things, I think about the omission, I should never say sad, but one of the things I regret most in this exhibition, not being able to have because it's in a private collection, and so the lender wouldn't lend it to us, is this painting, which if I was doing the exhibition with it, it would be the first thing you see because it really unpacks so much of what I'm going to be talking about in this lecture and what um, Cezanne is. It's one of the numerous canvases that Cezanne gifted to his friend Zola in the 1860s. And perhaps the most telling of their relationship, it's painted in the writer's home. It shows um, his inkwell, it's called the black clock, but it could easily be called the giant conch shell with a grimacing, which a gaping mouth or the, the giant saucer, um, because everything is given the same intensity, the same highlighted, very theatrical treatment. And especially those deep pleats which he's showing so definitively in this chiaroscuro. And you're going to see those it, later in his work, they become part of topographical, they become part of textiles. And it's one of those um, through lines that I was talking about that makes it to me difficult when people say, well, this is his first period as if he shuts the door and starts his second period, which is usually said to be around the time when he's working with Pissarro around Paris and Auvers-sur-Oise, but rather that I find this more of a continuum that these things reemerge in maybe different circumstances, but they're never completely abandoned. And this is a painting that Cezanne wanted to be represented by 10 years later at the Impressionist exhibition, the, what would have been the fourth Impressionist exhibition in 1878, which didn't happen, but he writes to Zola and he says, I hope you'll lend this to me. So it's a painting that remains important to him. And that same thing can be said about his portrait of his father, because in 1882, when he tries again, after many failures to, um, to submit a work to the Salon, he submits this portrait, which is actually accepted. So what that says to me that far from disparaging or thinking of these early works as something that you keep in a closet and you don't look at again, although many of his works did end up in closets not looked at, um, it's, it's something that he felt that there was real value in that. But his first real public opening, I guess, the public, the Parisian public rather, knowing about him was not through a real painting and an exhibition, but through this caricature. And I would put this under the rubric of even bad publicity is good publicity. And this happens in 1870 and it shows Cezanne, um, who's now been in Paris for almost a decade, wearing this kind of mountaineer's cap and he's defiantly walking, holding the two paintings that had just been rejected from the Salon. So he's leaving the Palais de l'Industrie where the Salon was held and he's holding the two paintings, one of which is 
this portrait of his friend, Achille Empereur, who, as you'll remember, is seated in the same seat, the armchair of his father, but now it's been reduced because Achille was a very small man. And so Cezanne has reduced the proportions of this piece of furniture in order to accommodate his friend. And the other painting, sadly now lost, was referred to as an large canvas of an angular nude. And they think the title was the, um, the wife of the sewer cleaner or la femme à la puce, so the woman of the, with the flea. And if it is one of those, then it's identifiable as, as having been in Gauguin's collection, although the painting's lost, so we don't know much more than this caricature, which becomes very important. So when you think about this, you know, oh, why would you submit your two paintings to the salon? You're going to show this plus this. That makes no sense at all. There's no homogeneity. But I think very much that Cezanne internally was in competition with the great realists of his time, Manet and Courbet. And I think that Manet, five years earlier, had done a similar bizarre pairing of paintings to submit to the Salon, the Olympia, the Courtesan, and Jesus insulted by the, by the soldiers, which is also a very strange representation of the godlike figure of Jesus. And um, I think that this was in, Cezanne's mind when he was thinking about this. And also even the idea of this large angular nude. If you look at the caricatures for Olympia, Olympia with her black cat, with the, um, with the uh, attending servant, the, the black woman who we now know is named Laura, thanks to Denise Morel's amazing exhibition of posing modernity that was at the Wallach collection at the, at the Wallach gallery at the Columbia University. But if you look at the caricature, I think it's almost because they're both caricatures, it's easier to see it's apples and apples. But also I think he had in mind this kind of weird non-narrative. And if you see in the bottom right corner, there's this kind of shape that looks like, um, I don't know, it looks like it's some kind of piece of furniture perhaps. And the caricaturist is including it and making sure that we notice it. Um, and I think that is also something that is important for Cezanne. And around the same time that, Cezanne, that Manet was exhibiting Olympia, Cezanne does this watercolor, which is much closer to the iconography with the nude on the bed, with the, the attendant, with the black cat, and with the spectator, the male spectator. So that the male spectator is what is the addition. And so now he's taking Manet's sort of theatrical painting into a kind of a different realm. But I want you to also look and just look at this on the right hand side of the watercolor. You see this, you know, the, the, oh, the upholstered chair and then look at this rosier, this again, this weird shape. And I, I, I sometimes think that these are kind of memory images that um, and domestic, domestic elements that he brings forth. Now from Manet's Olympia and from his large angular nude, he starts in the 1870s, uh, a series of paintings with the kind of narratives that made no sense to the Parisians when Manet shows it. There was no coherence between Olympia, the attendant and the, the black cat. And I think that is something that Cezanne was very much attuned to, this idea that there isn't one narrative, it's kind of an anti-narrative. And so he starts these paintings that are given the title Afternoon in Naples, probably because in 1867, he exhibited a painting, he was rejected, but he submitted a painting with that same title that had the same elements of the nude, the attendant and the male spectator. Um, as you can see, this is a painting very much in that kind of theatrical guise that we saw in the black clock. And I think it's really interesting when you think about what he's emphasizing to think about those pleats again and how the pleats of the tablecloth become the very similar to what you're seeing in this, not really a bed, it's kind of a raised dais. It's some sort of a platform covered with this cloud-like um, fabric that comes up again and again in these early paintings. And in another painting, 
And I should say about this painting, because now I'm looking at it again, the attendant figure here is very different from the Manet figure, for example, Lore. Now it, it's almost like this, she is part of this decorative object, which is kind of like a bronze object. And in some ways, similar, if you look at the table at the left, that small table, there is kind of an Atlantic figure holding up the table, which holds the platter of the fruits that are being served in this afternoon in Naples. And I think that he was trying to make a play on that. But this curtains, the drapery, the, um, you know, making this as just as theatrical as possible without any particular narrative um, was something that he was very interested and in that came from Manet. And in other paintings from around this time, I think that he sort of recreates, he brings the same elements, but now out into the the landscape. And this seems really an odd thing that he's done at exactly the same time. But now you have the well-dressed man, you have the nude still in this kind of crouching animal-like uh, position, and you have the natural draping this time of nature with the branches at the left and the right. And I see this also as a kind of a veiled nod of homage to Manet's um, other scandalous scene from a slightly earlier 1863, this co-ed scene that was exhibited originally under the title of Le Bain, the bath. And, um, and where you see the combination of the nude female and the well-dressed man, but also the female in the back who's dressed down, who's wearing this chemisette, you know, this kind of undergarment, as you see the man at the right also presumably near the water in his shirt sleeve. So these are just kind of, just thinking about these paintings that are so puzzling and so anomalous to what we think of in Cezanne that they may have not only a root in the paintings of artists he admired, although he would not want to talk too much about that, and that they remain somewhere stored in his memory and his sketchbooks. Now, the afternoon in Naples was, again, that was this theme of the courtesan, but this leads to something that was absolutely um, play on Manet much more overtly, because in 1874, Cézanne shows this painting on the right, the, La Moderne Olympia Esquisse, so the modern Olympia, a sketch, with the Impressionists at their exhibition, what was, what was their first exhibition. Um, and after having been turned away annually from the Salon uh, since 18, early 1860s, this was really his import, most important public showing to date in Paris. Um, now again, you have the same elements that the black attendant um, who in the afternoon in Naples was almost a decorative object, but now you have her given real agency. She's whisking off the veil and she's unveiling the crouching and animal-like figure of Olympia for the delectation of the male onlooker with this balding head. So this is where you start to think that Manet, that Cezanne is doing Manet one better. Like he's including himself so that we're not just the viewer looking and gazing at the nude, but now we're seeing it through his perspective. And his perspective is on this diagonally placed couch or some kind of platform, just like it is in the afternoon in Naples, um, which points directly to the object of his interest. And it was again, these same theatrical elements of draperies, of uh, repoussoir going this directional leading towards the object. And these um, and this incredible cloud-like bed, these these kind of textures and cloths that are using to affect different um, meanings for this, that I think are starting to be part of Cezanne's pictorial vocabulary. What the critics did not like about this, and there were a lot of things they did not like, but they especially didn't like the um, the distortions, the discontinuities, those same elements that made no sense in Manet's, they're finding in his, that this is, it doesn't add up. There's no there there. Um, and it's especially troubling that he showed it with two landscapes, 
that were quintessentially in the more impressionist mode of Pisapo, of Sisley. And so that did not help them to understand what he was trying to do with this. And um, I wonder if by putting the modern Olympia, he was simply saying that I'm going to redo Manet in my own way. Um, but he also adds the word esquis in the title, so sketch. So he's saying that this is a modern Olympia, but it's also something different than a tableau, than the painting. And I think it's worth unpacking that word for what it might have meant in the 19th century. If you go to the Grand Dictionnaire Larousse, you'll find that it's considered a work of imagination, of spontaneity, treated with ardor, verb, passion, warmth, and quickly made. Here we do not concern ourselves with the processes which make up pictorial science. We let ourselves go to inspiration. And then it goes on to say this definition in this dictionary. The sketch, the skis, does not require a method and must above all convey a feeling, a passion, a certain order of sensation. Now, what I didn't say, and I should have remembered to say when I showed you the caricature, that caricature went with an interview of the uh, with Manet with Cezanne at the time that his two paintings were refused, wherein Cezanne boasts about being nobody understands me, you know, this is what I do, and he and he says that you know about all his contemporary, he is the only one that really responds to his sensations, and he ends by saying, "And I have very strong sensations." So the term sensation was loaded for Cezanne from early on. It was what he felt he possessed above all and what he felt distinguished him from the other artists. Now, Après Midi in Naples, the, the watercolor for um, the, the um, I mean, the painting for the Olympia, the modern Olympia has, as I said, the same elements, but in the next series of paintings he would do with the title that we don't know was his or not, because Cezanne rarely titled his things and he rarely dated them and other people would title them for him. So you get these more narrative titles that he may or may not have wanted. But this whole succession that's called Après Midi en Naples is really a progression of what he was doing with these earlier paintings. Um, and it's, it's a consideration of his interest in this kind of storytelling, but at the same time, highly unusual. And many scholars, and it starts with Zola, talk about Cezanne's misogyny, that he, he really didn't like women and that he was afraid of them. Um, and it goes all the way up to our day. And the distinguished scholar, Henri Lorette, you know, said that for Cezanne, women are only capable of seduction and submission, of leading one astray, of accepting well-deserved punishment. Um, it's a little harsh, but um, I think that thankfully the exhibition on Madame Cezanne that Katie Kremnitzer, Dita uh, Armory did, that that is really put to bed that the idea, these paintings of the brothel of the boudoir were being done in the same decade that he is establishing his relationship with Hortense, that he has a child, Paul, born in 1872. Um, there, and I don't see that that necessarily leads to a misogynist um, interpretation of him or of his works. But here's, the, here's one of these um, after, afternoon in Naples. And you can see that now the male spectator has become the participant. And usually the male is in a slightly a darker color, but here it's kind of difficult because he has kind of long hair. So it's, it's not easy to know, but there's a narrative here of some sort. There's a chair that's been knocked over. Now the attendant is bringing them food. Um, and, but what's interesting is the way they both still float on this kind of cloud-like bed surface that we saw in his earlier representations. And in the watercolor, it's the same. Now the attending servant is opening up the drapery as well as serving. And I love this one is, which is, whoops, which is coming to the exhibition. It's at the National Gallery of Australia. And um, it's the painted version of the watercolor. And here you see the true interlocking forms of the male and the female on this kind of raised um, bed-like cloudy thing. 
And it's interesting that Zola, in one of his early articles, essays on artists, and it's called Mon Salon, talks about the painting of the boudoir. And he says that, you know, a male nude just doesn't belong there, you know, nails. Uh -uh. And it's interesting that Cezanne is kind of flaunting that. And when I'm thinking in terms of what Impressionists painted and when they painted in these interior scenes, even all the way up to the Nobbies, it's really not until you get to Pierre Bonnard where you see the male and the female nudes in a bedroom. Uh, occupying the same space without and being sort of equally treated. So I think that is something that um, we that he is introducing. And scholars have said that these kinds of works are, you know, they're kind of his parodies. They're more playful and whimsical as opposed to his serious works, which are the ones that are based in nature rather than the imagination, the ones that he did with Pissarro. But I, I think, you know, for me, these also have a certain not only a charm, but they also have a certain excitement about them. And I think they're very experimental and something that might be um, looked at more closely. And in this painting, if you look at the skin on the black attendant, it's almost, um, you know, it's, it's blue. It is not having very little to do. It is, it is imagination. I think of almost Robin Williams and the, the genie of Aladdin, but it is so far removed from what he does do when he is observing. And this magnificent portrait of the model at the Académie Suisse, which will be in our exhibition, um, Scipio, where he is so careful to give you the very, all of the different flesh tones that make up this expanse of back that's turned to us. And it's very modern, modernized portrait and the lights falling on him. But I also think it's interesting that he's leaning on this odd, Again, pillow-like, soft fabrics. There's something that he is um, leaning on that reappears throughout the paintings that Cezanne does in the 1870s and up to the 1880s and in some of his bathers, as we'll see. So for him, time, memory, imagination, and observation, these are things that start from the very beginning and can be said to be true about his works. Um, as throughout his life. And I think it's really interesting that um, at the same time that he can be doing works like the landscape, at the, this is in the Art Institute's collection, the panoramic view of Auvers, which you see shows on the left, that tall skinny building, that is the home of Dr. Gachet, <clears throat> the first owner of the modern Olympia that I showed you earlier, the sketch. Uh, so he's doing these kind of works from observation, probably with Pissarro at that time, but he's also doing works that are incredibly imaginative, like this eternal feminine, where he's really gone wild with Manet's theme of the courtesan Olympia, um, with this frenzy of characters, and now her private boudoir has literally become this kind of thoroughfare for mankind from the ecclesiastical to the musicians, to the workers, to the painter at the far right, who is sketching, supposedly painting her onto the canvas, but he's, he's looking towards the nude, but what he's sketching is this kind of canopy, which also can be seen to presage what he will do, of course, with his uh, Mont saint Victoire. Also, again, the, the nude is on this raised dais, some, and above it, there is this large pastoral scene. You can see the frame of it. You can see just the, the bottom eighth, um, and it's on this very ambitious scale. And I think that's interesting, too, because at this time, Man, uh, Cezanne was writing to Zola that he had hoped to work on these monumental murals at his home at Jardin Buffon in the south of France. Now, many believe that this composition comes from the Delacroix death of the, uh, excuse me. Many believe that this composition comes from the Delacroix death of the Sardanapalus, which Cezanne certainly sketched um, at the Louvre and had a framed print of in his last studio. So, and I think that if you look at the drawing that is said to be for the Eternal Feminine, this painting at the Getty Museum, which will also be in our exhibition, um, that you can really see that there is kind of those same components that it may have started out sort of morphing 
the elements from the Delacroix into something that, of course, he makes his own, that he makes very much his personal expression, where you see this is the figure at the very top, now on the left-hand side, and on the right, you see a figure that could be what is the beginning of the artist figure in the final um, painting. It's almost easier to understand this painting by looking at a watercolor where it's a little more distinguishable who is who. Uh, but again, you see that Cezanne is not the artist at the easel. He is not the young man, the thinner young man, nor is he the older man, but he is in that position at the very center of the bottom where you see the bald head. Uh, that I think is probably a kind of a self-portrait maybe, but definitely the an artist, someone that's spectating, someone that is not only watching and being part of it, but almost like an orchestra conductor, like someone who is on looking to the scene of frenzy and somewhat chaotic um, groups of people. So this has always been considered um, his response to things, the courtesans of Manet, but I think it's also very, interesting to think about it in terms of Zola, because he's still really good friends with Zola at this time. And Zola had already begun making preparatory notes for the novel that will be published in 1880, first in serial, Nana. And Nana is all about the blonde Venus, this woman that men put her on a pedestal and she basically ruins them. Um, and she goes through many different types of male admirers. And I think that there is something to be said about this um, organized chaos that Zola presents in many, many words. So he has pages to develop the characters. He's, he can do this and kind of lose himself in it. Cezanne has a two dimensional surface. And I think this is um, this kind of woman at the apex under this canopy enthroned in this cloud-like bed with mankind behind her. I think this is really interesting to think about if you think about the conversations they may have had about their youthful fantasies, not what they were observing, but what they fantasized about. And that's another um, another source for would be Flaubert for Cezanne in this Temptation of St. Anthony, where the nude that was rather passively being admired is now a raising her drapery and showing off her charms to the, the devil feature, these other people. Again, the titles are applied, but we don't actually know because these were never exhibited in Cezanne until late, until the 1890s, until that exhibition at Vollard for whatever reasons. Um, and that same kind of drapery, that same kind of uh, the woman exposing herself, but also the soft cloth that's part of nature that's now become a tent for these bathers in the 80s, so decades later, that reappears and nature itself becomes this kind of a theatrical setting. And that has to do a lot also with what Cezanne and Volard, uh, Zola talked about. In their early letters, they're constantly talking about what they're going to do when they're back in the south of France. And Cezanne makes a point of talking about the curtained nature is a curtain and they're going to have the perfect picnic and Cezanne does a little sketch of how the trees will frame the site and in kind of a shape like an amphitheater. And that also is a compositional device that appears again and again in Cezanne's work. And I think it's always tempting to look for sources in Cezanne because he's so extraordinarily prolific. And I can't help but think that those women kind of wade in the, in the water on the right, come out of that um, dejeuner of Manet that I showed you earlier. Um, another example very early on of this, so this is something, as I said, it's a continuation, is this small painting with a woman also uplifting, making a kind of a tent out of her drapery. And this was owned, he gave this to Pissarro. So again, that early temptress, bather, Olympia, um, how morphing of elements from one situation to another. As I said, these were never shown until the um, 1895. And um, that was the eternal feminine, for example, came into that exhibition, not as the eternal feminine, but as la femme. 
simply the woman. That's how it entered into the dealer Volard's inventory. So it is really uh, difficult because he doesn't date and he many times doesn't title. Now, the problem with Cezanne probably was that he was so ridiculed by the modern Olympia, the sketch, that he went, uh, that he, for 1877, when he shows again with the Impressionists, he decided out of the 17, he's not going to show anything like that. And out of the 17 paintings and watercolors he shows, seven of them, he says, are etude. Etude being something that is taken from nature and unlike the uh, esquisse, is something that is very studied, that is very observed, not a, not a sketch of passion. So he shows these, and these are two more that he shows at that time. Um, and then he also shows the bathers, and he calls this a projet de tableau, that this is a project for a serious painting. Well, etude is something that really speaks to his inability to finish. It's an etude and anytime he restarts, he's got to start something more because for him, um, it was it was the idea of realizing his sensation that could never be attainable. And so they remain as etude. It's something very specific to him. And projet de tableau is equally specific because it's again, something on the way to being. So while he doesn't make the grand finale painting of this, he uses the elements again, again, and again in these different variations on a theme because those elements are what are important to him. It's not so much the finished tableau, but how that he can keep thinking about them and copying himself into his own paintings. Um, Degas was also very impressed by that central figure of the bathers, which he copied um, probably intrigued by the fact that he shows it not only from looking down, but also frontally. And the bathers, um, the problem with studying, trying to figure out what the Impressionist artists saw in Cezanne's work and why did they want to possess them is difficult because Kayabat, for example, bought that Rococo vase I showed you early on. And he also bought this painting after the exhibition in 1877, but he doesn't talk about it. Dugas doesn't talk about why he is drawn to Cezanne. Gauguin, as I said, writes a little bit about it, but it's not until the later artists who visit Cezanne in his last years who start publishing their correspondence and their conversations with him that you really get a sense of what the artist is telling them and what they're seeing in his work. Now, the Cezanne would continue to paint the nudes, whether mythological or as modern courtesans throughout his career, along with scenes of modern landscapes, portraits, still lives and bathers. And in the 1880s, he fixated on this figure, this figure that was put into getting a patent as a trademark for a champagne called um, the um, Nana, perhaps because of the popularity of Zola's book since it's 1880 is the terminus postquem, uh, antiquem, and Cezanne does these drawings, never completely copying, but very much intrigued by this, this, this reclining figure. So you see her holding the champagne in the one on top, but in the bottom, he shows another male figure, at least part of it, it could be himself. Again, that element of the bather and the male onlooker. And in this painting in the Barnes collection, which will not come to the exhibition, which we wished it would have, he's turned that, um, he's turned the domestic pillows, the, the bedside into um, a swan, much more in keeping with the idea of Leda and the Swan, the classical theme. But I think it's really fascinating that in the smaller version that was painted seven years later, um, he changes it completely. And now she is in her boudoir, she's in the bedroom scene, but now the swan is uh, a dishcloth, the dishcloth with the red stripe that we saw in the very beginning in the still life with eggs, which is now uh, sort of in this very sexy scene. Otherwise, he's introduced this domestic and then this kind of um, fruits that are sort of falling into it alluding, of course, to his own still lives at that time, which were often set on these tea towels with their red stripe. And this is just a, a detail of the Art Institute's basket of apples that they showed you earlier. So 
I think it's, and then this is another variation of that. So you have the compressed boudoir interior, but now you have a woman whose who's pillows and herself have this kind of soft boulder-like quality that would link her up to the um, landscapes, the boulder scenes, the quarries of his latest work. And I think this is incredible how he can bring that nude out into nature. And this is a painting that Duga bought shortly after the 1895 exhibition. Uh, again, she's floating on this kind of a textile uh, in a sort of um, odd mixture of mythological and modern. And something that intrigued him so much that he did variations on a theme to watercolor and um, drawings. And it's, it's, it's just showing how for him, nothing, everything is salvageable, nothing, everything can be reused, recycled, reemerged in a different format for a different uh, view. And I know I've been focusing on the females and I do think it's those early courtesan paintings that, that tie in very closely with his bathers. But of course he did do male bathers. And I think this, this one shows a little bit about how Cezanne is thinking of forms and fragments. So this is a very small painting at the Art Institute. But if you look where I have the arrow, what looks to be like kind of a haphazard way of showing drapery are actually the underdrawing, the drawing for two legs that he just decides not to do. Or this is a fragment for a larger composition that either he cut down or perhaps his dealer cut down. But it's the idea we've been looking at underdrawing and many times the underdrawing has very little to do with the underpainting with what the painting ends up being. And then just to show a couple of more with these elements of the arc, the canopy, the natural amphitheatre that he talked about in his letters with Zola, the claws, the uh, textiles that are fragmented, that are twisting, that are on the ground or miraculously, excuse me, miraculously held up by unknown forces that form these pathways that help you um, understand spatial distances, the directions. I think all of this is kind of coming out of these um, memories in some ways. Now, in the end, it's easy to think of Cezanne's early works as kind of anomalies. Those, those were, were drawn from these fait divers, the passion, the violent scenes. And to think of them as done by an artist who was uh, impulsive, immature, uh, but as I've hoped to show, Cezanne's often public, puzzling early works are really no less deliberate and intentional than the bathers and the still lifes of the later ones, the ones that are more recognizably Cezanne. The boudoir compositions like Eternal Feminine, the Modern Olympia, like all of his works are the product of his constant experimentation. Within the limitations that he posed himself of scale, of paper, of canvas, of paint of watercolor, he continues to develop these pictorial strategies that draw on his imagination, his memory, and his observation to evolve different approaches to mark making. And these mark making, he wants that to combine the initial excitement of the esquisse and the never ending quest for the sensation that he felt was embodied in the etude. And I know that there and I'm just showing you uh, quickly this second nude that you've seen earlier, small, the one that has these sort of rock-like forms. But I also think it's interesting that in the large bather in Philadelphia, he added a strip of painting, um, added a strip at the bottom to this canvas. And I'm, I'm wondering what was going on in his mind at that time. And I know that these are light year, that Cezanne is light year apart from Marcel Proust, but I, I sometimes think about Cezanne's incredible memory and that the and Proust's Recherche de Temps Perdu, um, and where an object or a musical stanza is resuscitated through this kind of involuntary memory. And I think that for Cezanne, these domestic elements that we saw at the beginning of this presentation, the tablecloth, the drapery, the arch of the canopy, they're not necessarily abandoned when he switches stylistically to slightly different but that they reemerge as a kind of muscle memory to help push forward a new pictorial vocabulary. And since I am speaking to this group, this studio school group, I'd like to close with the words of a contemporary artist 
Lynette Viadombauché, who described the major shift in her artwork as going from the sense of trying to illustrate an idea to allowing the paint to bring something to life, to thinking about painting as a language in itself. Thank you. Okay. Clap for everyone, Gloria. That was that was really brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, wow. Um, I I want to just give everybody time. Um, you know, it, again, there's the Q and A button at the bottom of your screen. Um, please do uh, put in your questions there, and uh, and we'll we'll answer as many as we can um, before we have to sign off. But it's really fascinating to me to see those images of. Uh, the uh, the champagne nana um, and those drawings and then no, to know all those Lita paintings that Cezanne did it's um, really fascinating. Um, um, so um, yeah, there's comments coming in about how wonderful the talk was. Um, uh, there's a question here um, uh, from. A, Gail Mooney, uh, wondering, um, they would be interested to know where the references to the works being a etude or uh, I, I should put the titles under which he exhibited them. And that's where those etude and esquisse come from, Gail. Um, I was reading off the LaRousse dictionary, but he actually put those, so he designated his paintings, not as paintings, but as something on the way to being a painting. But uh, those titles go away. I mean, you're not going to show a Cezanne in your in your museum as etude. Probably not. We wouldn't. Maybe we would. Is there any documentation from Vollard about the titles used in that 1895 exhibition? Well, they were apparently added on by his friend, um, Marius Roux. There were other people, or Alexis, Paul Alexis, rather. So Cezanne, I mean, his son was really the one who organized that exhibition, right? So Cezanne really had um, very little to do with it, we think, and um, wasn't, you know, was glad it was happening, but wasn't so much of an active participant when it came to um, trying to date and title his works. I think that's really a key point for a lot of artists, honestly. Um, here's a, um, a, Joyce Shapiro is asking if you, if you know of any or see any influence from Puvi de Chafan. I think so. I mean, I, I actually do those sort of um, uh, stylized figures or simplified nudes. I'm not sure if, uh, I mean, he does talk about Cuvée de Chavin, but in a kind of pejorative way, although he talks about artists, a lot of artists in a rather pejorative way, because he's trying really to keep himself, you know, his, his whole goal is to remain true to his sensation. So he says that, you know, his nudes are lifeless, that there's no blood in them. And, um, and that's pretty interesting when you think about what his nudes are going to evolve into. But uh, so, yeah, I mean, he's, he's aware of everything. I mean, he's going to the Louvre how many hours a day. He's, he's going to the exhibitions, he's going to galleries. He's part of Parisian life. I mean, he's, he's going to the artist's cafes. He's with Manet and the future impressionist. So he's, He's not a country bumpkin by any ways. That's his persona that he wants people to think about because he wants to distinguish himself. But it's uh, he's he's much more of a, a taking in um, all art. Um, Karen Wilkin. Oh, hi, Karen. <laughs> yeah, Karen. Uh, Karen gives a loud applause, and uh, she says she can't wait for the show. It's wonderful to see the early works given their due. I've always thought the intensity of those works becomes the intensity of, of becomes the intensity of scrutiny in the later works. Yeah, and I mean there are uh, there are Andre Dombrowski, Nina, and I mean there are other people who have, set, have pointed that out, but I don't think that in exhibition. Um, it's been quite as um, flesh, fleshed out. That's a, probably a not a good term to be using at this point. But, um, and so that's what we're gonna try to do is really show him, as I said, a 360 and how things are connected, interconnected, not in chapters. Um, there's a couple of comments here. Uh, one from 
Dennis Cardon mentions Corbet's allegory of the studio in comparison to the eternal feminine. And there's another comment of uh, the looming presence of, of Manet um, in Cezanne's works of 1860s and 70s is fascinating. And what about Corbet? Um, thank you. Yeah, no, I, I, you know, I had that slide in there uh, and I took it out because it was already way too long and I apologize for going over. But yeah, I mean, the, the Atelier de, de l'Artiste where he's got the nude and everybody's looking at him, the artist. It's like the, the you know, the reverse. And yeah, I think he definitely looked at Courbet, but he wasn't around Courbet. I think that's the difference. I mean, he was um, you know, there's, there's lots of anecdotes about how Manet would make room for him, but he would say, I can't shake your hand because I haven't washed in a week. I mean, there's lots of funny anecdotes between Manet and Cezanne, but they, they did know each other. And so I think there was a closer connection uh, to his art through the personal connection. Um, Phyllis Tuckman is uh, asking of all the art <laughs> of all the artists you've worked with, was Cezanne the painter who more colleagues admired? I think that, yes. I mean, I, I, Cezanne is the most difficult artist, um, but he is the most challenging to work with. Absolutely. Because, uh, I mean, I gave you just a little bit, but you can go down so many rabbit holes with Cezanne trying to figure out what, he's trying to do, uh, it, there's not as easy a progression as there was with someone like Claude Monet, who has variations on a theme, but you can always follow the theme uh, either topographically um, or stylistically. But with Cezanne, it's, uh, as I said, I showed you the, the landscape that he does at the same time of eternal feminine. So it's, it's, uh, he's capable of a, a wide range of approaches to art and topics at the same time simultaneously. Um, and just, just coming back to Corbet really quick, um, what about Corbet's, uh, one of the last bather images you showed in uh, Corbet's Montpellier bathers? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, there's, there's, there's paths to be, to be made, you know, this is, a, I, I limited it to, Manet because it, I was really excited when the Getty said that they'd lend us eternal feminine. And so I kind of started with that as she is the fulcrum. I started with her and kind of worked out from that. But you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, a lot, um, a lot of resonance is there. Um, Amy Madden is asking, uh, Cezanne is often seen per his late work as a kind of metaphysical formalist, but he also loved that mountain. Is there, is, is there the sensation still in the late paintings? If so, where, or how do you see it manifested? Well, I think that is really where the artist artist comes in and I'm not. So, um, but I think that, um, that that passion that you see more literally in the early works is very much there. I mean, every touch, every mark has a reason for being there and he leaves it when he can no longer um, feel that same sensation. So, that, which is why so many of them are unfinished or seemingly unfinished, but they aren't really unfinished. And I think that's where it makes it hard for someone like me who um, only knows paintings from my looking into a painting, either in the conservation lab or as an art historian, but not from having made it, that that question is best um, geared to a, a practicing artist. Um, and I'm not trying to cop out on that one. I just, I just, I really believe that. I think that's a great answer, um, <laughs> personally. Um, a, a couple, speaking to, to the, the conservation efforts, um, could you just speak to that uh, and that you've undertaken for the exhibition? And I'm, I'm curious about the synthetic, you mentioned early on a synthetic, um, was it a glaze? No, it's a synthetic varnish. So, uh, you know, our paintings, because most of them have been with us um, before 1950, they, there was a, in the 60s, especially, they, you know, they would put a synthetic varnish rather than the, the varnish that discolored. Um, 
the wax varnish and those those make it i mean you know it's not awful because they aren't discoloring but what they do is they kind of give it a plasticize there's just something that masks all those delicate touches that you find in i mean we just did the um the bay of marseille and the sky it looks like it's almost like watercolor in the way he's applied the 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 soft blues and whites and we never saw that before and these you know passages were in the still life that i showed you the passages of the dishcloth and just how many colors go into that and the crevices you never saw it because it it sort of does what a photograph does it sort of flattens it out um, so and and that's the problem with photography because even after we've cleaned it and we have and it looks to our eyes transformed you take a photograph of it and it's still blasting light on it and it you don't get to see those nuances that we can see face to face. And that's why I hope in this exhibition, we don't put glass on ours. We don't glaze our paintings. And I'm hoping that we'll have a lot from institutions and private collections that will also be without any kind of protection. So you, can, you can't get your nose up to them because you'll be slapped by the guards, but you can get close, you can get close. So the, so the paintings are presented without that, that varnish whatsoever? In right, We're, we are not putting back on a varnish. We thought about spot varnishing them. You know, sometimes we did that with some of the Monet uh, stacks of wheat because what was happening was they were becoming amorphous and we sort of added a little just to bring out um, a passage. But so far we haven't felt the need to do that. So the, we have now finished taking the synthetic varnish off all of our Manet paintings in preparation for this exhibition and for the catalog. Oh, so exciting. Um, maybe, maybe just a couple more just about the exhibition if we have time. Um, sure. Karen, Karen, is, Karen Wilkin is wondering uh, who are some of the contemporary artists who were- Oh, yeah. Um, well, I, you know, I don't, I never know if I should say these things um, now, but I guess they're going to be printed up sooner or later. Uh, so Julia Fish is from Chicago and she is contributing. Uh, Carrie James Marshall is also a Chicago artist, but we also have Laura Owens. We have uh, Paul Chen. Uh, uh, Etel Adnan had written on Cezanne and she's very kindly allowing us to re-publish um, her thoughts on Mont saint Victoire, which are incredible. And um, uh, there are a couple of Ellen Gallagher, um, trying to think there are a couple of others I'm, I'm missing there's 10 and I'm sorry I'm, I'm not able to remember everyone but there, it's artists who um, are very much oh, Luke Toymans um, yeah I think I've almost named them all does wow. that help yeah yeah I mean that's it's really exciting um, yeah. and they were excited and they were excited and we tried to pick we tried to pick artists who could see the work that they were going to write about. You know, I mean, we tried to match them up, well, not matchy matchy, but talk to them about what they wanted to write about. But also in the case of Julia Fish, for example, she could come and look at the skulls watercolor in our collection. And that made it more meaningful for her to be able to write from the object, which is what we were hoping for, that they wouldn't do, you know, they didn't need to do art history. We're doing that, they, it was artists, looking at Cezanne. Wow. Um, Why Cezanne? Why Cezanne? Yeah. Cezanne. Um, and there was an earlier question. Um, if, if you could, uh, from Lisa, she's just wondering if you could repeat the, the information about the exhibit. Um, oh, okay. So it opens May 15th in um, 2022 at the Art Institute. Um, as you saw, there are about a hundred paintings and then there's um, half again as many works on paper, watercolors. And we have quite a good section of the late watercolors. And I know MoMA is doing an exhibition on Cezanne's drawings and watercolors, which is gonna open in June this year. So that's super exciting. I can't wait uh, to see that. And um, so it then it closes in September of 2022 and then it goes to the Tate Modern in November of 22 and finishes up at the end of January or beginning of February. This is all, of course, if we stay the way we are and everybody, you know, 
gets their vaccines and yeah, yeah. Yeah, <clears throat> knock on wood. We've come yeah, so far. We're knocking on a lot of things, yeah. Um, since last April. Um, um, maybe just one or one question or uh, I don't wanna, I, I don't wanna use up too much of your time. Um, <laughs> But uh, this is a, a interesting. Got my coffee. Okay, <laughs> I had mine. Um, uh, Dennis Cardin is asking. Uh, he he says, "Do you think that one of Cezanne's major contributions was the way he changed the relationship of meaning to image?" So many questions arise as to the icon iconographic meaning of certain passages that appear in his work that previously are never asked about his contemporaries. Yeah, I think the fact that he's, you know, except with the exception of those early that um, I think are coming out of a different conversation, but leave elements that he can still use. Um, the fact that he limits himself, not only in the materials he uses, I mean, he's not that experimental when you think about it. I mean, he's not like Doga or someone. And his limitation of categories, if you think about it, you know, there's still life support groups um, that, that's when you start looking within those categories and within those sort of, oh, I, I recognize that or I recognize this. And that's where the excitement comes. It's what he does within those categories as an artist. Again, that's probably uh, a better uh, question for an artist than me, but that's what I'm seeing. You know, that you, you, you get caught up, not in the iconography as bather mountain uh, tree, but, in the, in the way that these elements migrate, you know, and they morph and there's just this ex extraordinary um, command in some ways, but also a letting go to push himself further. Um, it's, it's, he's, he's a difficult artist to articulate because of that, um, because so much of it is um, felt as well as seen. Yeah. Well, Gloria, that, this has just been a, a wonderful, wonderful talk. Thank you so much. I can't imagine a better way to end the Studio School's uh, spring lecture series than to have you speaking on Cezanne, um, an artist who is so close to, to um, where we come from at the school. So. <laughs> <Where are you? laughs> um, He's so important to us. And uh, this this lecture is, you know, we're all going to get on a bus and go to Chicago. Um, <laughs> so Thanks. thank you so much. And thank you to all of you who have joined us and uh, stayed stayed around. Uh, there's so many comments of bravo, wonderful talk, terrific lecture. So um, thank, you. thank you so much. And, um, and um, everyone have a wonderful evening.